All right. Well, I want to welcome everyone to our uh, uh, series here on sustainable landscapes that benefit wildlife and people. Before we get started, we always have to do our membership spotlight. And so I am excited about an event coming up with two of our members teaming together, Tom Bassadilly Architects and Eco Achievers. Um, they are doing a lead uh, uh, mid-construction uh, site tour tomorrow, as of this webinar anyway. Um, so you can check that out um, if you want to go to that and learn more about aging in place and lead platinum opportunities. Um, and uh, if you can't make it, there'll be more information on uh, Tom's website and maybe even a virtual tour will do. So stay tuned for that. And you know, this is who Green Home Institute members are, and this is what Green Home Institute members do. So can you, so consider signing up and supporting our work. All right, well, I'm very thrilled for, again, sustainable, sustainable landscapes that benefit wildlife and people. Uh, before we get started, a huge thanks to our top tier sponsor, uh, Reem, who's providing uh, uh, heat pump water heaters. These take natural heat out of the air and use it to heat water uh, with zero emissions directly up to 400% efficiency. They now have a 120 volt system uh, that helps ensure uh, you can uh, swap out old gas appliances for uh, new heat pump water heaters that don't require all the electrical upgrades and expense. Um, and they're available potentially up to $2,000 for Inflation Reduction Act tax credits. So check them out over at Ream. Dot org the 120 volt water heater as well as our sponsors uh ava windows thanks to uh, their support uh for having high performance home windows all right again uh welcome to sustainable landscapes that benefit wildlife and people this course is brought to you by the green home institute green home institute is a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. Uh, um, my name is Brett Little. I will be your moderator and co-presenter today. I'm the education manager here. Uh, we are a very small but mighty team ready to assist you. This course is approved for multiple continuing education units, including our certified green home professional designation under the water and place pillar. AIA health, welfare, and safety may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor a license. Um, now I'm really excited because a lot of times, you know, here at the Green Home Institute, we uh, focus on other aspects of sustainability and green building, just because that's where a lot of the excitement is. That's where a lot of the tax credits are. And so, um, you know, we spend a lot of time focusing on uh, the two or three main key pillars of green building being energy, uh, and health, air quality, environmental quality, sometimes materials and durability. And a lot of times um, we don't get to spend a lot of time talking about the place pillar, having a sense of place, the location of the site, how it impacts the rest of the project and it impacts the planet and community at large. So it's one area where I'm always thrilled when we do get to have some really great content about uh, the impact of our site. And so how this fits into um, lead green rating and green building systems, and whether you're doing lead or not, um, just an, a, a great opportunity, but it's an innovative credit, which is how I learned about it through this innovation opportunity within the lead program, where as long as 50% of the planned landscaping uh, meets the uh, certified wildlife habitat, you can achieve this um, innovation design and credit. So we're gonna be talking a lot about what this program is and how you can achieve it and really what the benefits are, whether you're doing LEED or another green building program or just wanna make your own home or your projects better, you know, we don't care. Now, the other cool thing is that many times uh, with LEED and green building, you benefit one area, you benefit many areas. And for, for sustainable sites and outdoor living and wildlife, this is one area where you're benefiting many aspects. And so we're gonna get into all the details about this, but at a high level, just by um, um, making this commitment, you're looking at benefiting the, uh, 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 the prerequisite of having no invasive plants, potentially reducing the heat island effect of the building, uh, which is getting worse as things heat up, and uh, rainwater management, which is getting worse again as we're dealing with higher stormwater 
uh, uh, issues and rainwater issues that are getting um, uh, more frequent uh, in nature. On top of that, uh, when it comes to water conservation, you're, you're talking about saving water by benefiting wildlife. And so by having a reduced amount of turf grass, you're getting water conservation points or using the, the total whole home uh, water use approach uh, by reducing water both inside and also outside, which we're talking about here, and knowing your water savings. Now, the thing to remember when you're doing a lead project is if whatever you've de designated your outdoor site to be, that will impact all of these different areas. You have to make sure you're measuring all within that same square footage or acreage, uh, looking at the water use, the um, turf to grass ratio, and all of these uh, heat uh, sections here must be compliant, must be using the same measurements. And so again, we're looking at 50% set aside of the total site being used for this credit. Um, so you would have to include all of these other items if you're trying to achieve it. So that's lead, but let's um, introduce our speaker here, um, Mary Phillips. I'm really excited to have her on and um, her talking about their program and how it fits in and can benefit you no matter what you're doing. So Mary, um, welcome and please do take it away. Great, thank you so much, Brett. And I'm so grateful for you to have me uh, on the webinar today. And also grateful to the US uh, Green Building Council that has included uh, this certification process as part of the Innovative Points system. I'm going to give you a little bit of overview on the program for those of you that don't know about it and a little history. And then we're going to get into the elements of each of the habitat requirements uh, that you need to actually certify your property. So I'm really excited and I'm going to share my screen now. So we have actually, this is an exciting time to be to be here and talk to you today, 2023. Um, we are celebrating our 50th anniversary. We have been in this space um, since 1973. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. Um, first of all, National Wildlife Federation, uh, our mission is um, uniting all Americans to ensure that wildlife and people thrive in this rapidly changing world. And we've been around um, for over um, 87 years. So we, we've been in this space and we're a federation, which means we bring many, many people together. Um, we have uh, 52 state affiliates that represent our leadership uh, in National Wildlife Federation and are doing this kind of work in their states and different levels. So um, we're a very broad based organization. So as I mentioned, um, we've been around for a while. We actually are the uh, nation's largest and longest running native plant habitat movement. We have um, millions of people involved, uh, which I'll share in a second, uh, the scope and scale of this program. And what we're really trying to do is help wildlife thrive where people live, work, play, learn, and worship. And what we're finding out over the years, especially in this last decade with a lot more resource, we're also really helping people thrive as well. So I'll, I'll get into some of those benefits and how it helps uh, both wildlife and people. So just a little history, this program started, um, we launched it in 1973, but it was based on research done in 1972 by two U.S. Forest Service researchers that showed when they were looking at public lands and um, large scale landscape restoration, the elements, the biological elements of food, water, cover, and places to raise young, which are the core elements of any uh, habitat, actually worked in small scale backyard habitat. And um, in 1973, uh, we actually launched this program as the Backyard Habitat Program. We've since saved the changed the name to Certify Wildlife Habitat to be more expansive of the various areas on properties that people could uh, do this work. Some people were literally saying like, oh, I guess it's just for my backyard. And we're like, no, it's not, <laughs> it's much broader. So that's how we got the, the name change. Um, so based in research and now continuing to focus on research to show the impact of this work that everyone can do and make a difference in, we've been working, National Science Foundation funded a multi-year study, and part of this study was to um, look at the wildlife impact, uh, insect impact, a variety of um comparisons across different landscape management, in, in particular residential yard management. And they actually looked in five metro areas of the urban suburban uh, yards around uh, those areas and compared certified wildlife habitat yards to other more traditionally managed yards with 
heavy lawn and ornamental plants, as well as some other natural settings as well. And what they really came down with that these yards that were specifically managed for wildlife actually supported more diverse and heterogeneous bird communities um, and also engaged high public interest and support of these species and particularly species of conservation concern. Uh, so, and just to give you a little snapshot from that study, um, they actually documented that there were more uh, bird species. I'm gonna show you this little fun <laughs> uh, visual um, in the certified wildlife habitat yards, they were seeing kind of what they call turnover yard over yard. They were seeing many more wood thrushes and um, pileated woodpeckers and other types of birds. Conversely, the non-certified yards um, that were more traditionally heavy lawn focus um, were just like the common, um, mo mostly non-native, house sparrows and European starling, grackles, that kind of thing. So they really were seeing a significant uh, difference of the impact this uh, intentional uh, maintenance can do. Just scope, we are at uh, 298,000 certified wildlife habitats over these 50 years. We're hoping to get to 300,000 in our calendar year of the 50th anniversary. We're, we're close. I, I, I'm hoping we'll get there. Um, but it's really, it, we talk about it being in the U.S., but actually people have really gotten excited about this. They really are. These sites are across North America. And we also have uh, worked with the State Department because many embassies and other State Department properties have actually uh, implemented these practices as well. So really excited about that scope and scale. And to just give you a snapshot of how these break down, um, we have 90% of our residential properties, uh, and they really run the gamut of uh, a variety of places here, and over 10,000 are schoolyard habitats. And as I'm mentioning, it can be anywhere. It can be at home, at work, a farm, um, you know, schools, universities, it could be rooftops, it could be, you know, a park, a place of worship. So they really do um, run that that scope uh, of various opportunities to, to do this work. So let me get into what it really comprised of. So I mentioned food, cover, water, places to raise young. What we're really doing to provide those is looking at uh, layering a landscape with structural plants, obviously colorful flowering plants, ground covers and filler plants. And one of the things that's really important is to think about that benefit of this structured and layered uh, garden design for certified wildlife habitat is actually you're helping above and below the ground. There's habitats, there's micro habitats, all of that are benefiting various species um, really across the, the full food chain. One of the other really important things is that layered planting and stormwater management. So this layered and dense planting actually really helps with managing stormwater runoff. Um, one of the reasons, and we're gonna talk a lot about native plants and their roots in a couple minutes, but those roots um, really do help uh, with uptaking the water into the root system. The other thing is, is that a certain percentage of these roots die back and regrow and they create channels in the soil and these channels allow for better infiltration of the groundwater. So that's one area um, that uh, many areas that native plants help um, not only wildlife, but also our communities. The other thing is really around heat, the heat island effect. So having rain gardens um, and actually just having lots of natural native landscape um, also helps reduce the heat island effect. Um, but particularly with the rain gardens, they collect rainwater and allow it to absorb into the ground where it has more time to evaporate and cool. So um, lots of opportunities uh, to make an impact again above and below uh, the ground. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Brett for a minute to talk a little bit about how this connects to some of the points. Yeah, thanks, Mary. So again, as I mentioned, uh, there are a lot of interconnections um, within LEED on the outdoor sustainable sites when you commit to uh, wildlife certified landscapes for the innovation credit. Um, so two areas out there are the rainwater management and the heat island reduction credits. And a lot of the rainwater management and heat island already naturally go hand in hand. Uh, the more you uh, typically um, plant um, uh, greenery, um, which is going to potentially ideally absorb rainwater. You're also um, offsetting hardscapes that are otherwise going to absorb heat and cause that heat island effect overheating 
uh, spaces. And so some of the areas I highlighted from both the rainwater uh, management credit, which I, uh, is on your left, and the heat island credit on the right, um, uh, that I wanted to point out again are planting areas with native or adaptive plant materials. Again, as long as those ones are also supporting wildlife, you kind of have that two for one. And installing permanent infiltration or collection features such as vegetated swales, rain gardens. Again, those types of rain gardens, those vegetated swales, those can all be connected uh, to your uh, wildlife habitat. So again, it's serving multiple purposes. Um, and so you're going to be using low impact development and looking at documenting uh, the site and the landscape, which you already have to do to comply with the wildlife landscaping. And so you're going to be looking at some additional features as well for rainwater management. Uh, if you have larger projects, commercial projects, you're probably going to be getting an engineer involved who's going to be doing a water analysis. And we've done some education on that stormwater analysis. And then looking at heat island effect, again, you're measuring that entire area of the site. And 50% of that area has to be in compliance um, with both either shading or non-absorptive materials. So again, if you're removing uh, hardscapes uh, that could otherwise be set aside for wildlife, those same hardscapes uh, and natural plantings, you know, potentially are going to be things that attract wildlife and are not absorbing heat, uh, which is also protecting the wildlife as well. So again, it's all connected. It's all benefiting uh, and there's multiple ways to score many credits and achieve a more sustainable outcome. So thanks, Mary. Yeah, thank you so much. So getting into the specifics of how to do this habitat, as Brett was just referencing, um, these different combinations and layer density of plants, um, whether they're in bioswales or in other types of the rain garden piece, but also just again, generally on the property, um, they're the foundation of the food web in any ecosystem. And our native plants are so critical because they also support uh, so much of our insects. 90% uh, of insects uh, rely on plants that can only survive um, on those same plants, which they co-evolved. So that is why having and planting plants that are actually native to the, the region, the ecoregion, the area that you are located in and are doing your work is so essential. Um, general uh, other benefits is they're adapted to local soils. They're adapted to regional precipitation, which also gets into water savings because many of them are drought tolerant or adapted. So they don't need extra watering. Um, they're resilient and hardy once they're established. And of course they support wildlife. Um, an example is the oak. So the oak uh, genus really is amazing. Uh, it's what we call one of our super plants, our keystone plants. It's, it, it supports 557 species of caterpillars, which then, of course, support myriads of other types of uh, wildlife. And, um, for example, uh, an ornamental imported ginkgo supports zero species of native caterpillars of butterflies and moths. So that is why we really stress um, not uh, really including uh, all, all these. Also, sometimes these are invasive, some of these different ornamentals as well. Um, so just to look at kind of what you, the different components here, when we talk about cover, um, we're talking about plants that provide places for wildlife to rest or nest, um, sometimes evergreen leaves or needles. Um, those are some examples, shrubs and so forth. Um, host plants. These are absolutely key. And I'll talk about those uh, more specifically as we move into the food section. But it really, um, so many plants are not only for butterflies and moths, but we've done a number of uh, studies around pollen specialists, our native bees. 4,000 of our bees in the in the North America are native. And um, between 35 to 60%, depending on you, where you are regionally, are pollen specialist bees that can only survive with uh, the pollen uh, to feed their young from specific plants that they co-evolved with. We wipe out those plants, we wipe out those bee species. So really, really critical to look at this host plant uh, capability. And of course, providing general nectar and pollen for many different types of pollinators um, is really important. The keystone species, as I was just referencing, uh, both for butterflies and moths and the pollen specialist bees, that they absolutely need 
uh, to survive. In fact, Doug Tallamy, who we work closely with, has identified a keystone species as being um, the, the top uh, species that support up to 90% of these uh, insects and lepidoptera in, in, in uh, specialist bees in a certain area. Um, so we're also looking at different foliage, uh, nectar, pollen, all these things that, that we're talking about. We're going to go in more deeply in that in a minute. I'm going to say it here. I'm going to say it again. Our goal and what we've been advocating for in the certification process, ideally we'd love 100% native plants, but that's not always realistic. So we're trying to push people to do 50 to 70% native plants in the area that they're creating as this designated habitat um, native plant landscape. So one way to think about that in, in what's also really key is actually doing plant groupings that reflect the diversity of the local area that this garden is being installed. So really elements from natural landscapes to consider uh, the region that you're in. Um, is it a very, you know, grassland, shrubland, you know, those types of things to look at and then actually incorporate key characteristics that reflect that natural landscape of the area. The other wonderful thing about that is it really gives a unique look and feel to the landscape design that shows the natural history and natural heritage uh, of the site uh, uh, that you're creating. So one of the key things, as I mentioned before, sustainable gardening, we want to mimic nature uh, to benefit both wildlife and people. The goal is 50 to 70 percent native plants. Um, and also studies, we have a part on our website, um, nwf.org slash garden, that talks about the impact of wildlife habitat. We have seen several studies that show you will double the amount of wildlife once you start installing these elements. Um, really giving you 50% more wildlife than a traditionally lawn heavy, ornamental heavy landscape. Another way to look at this is to show the difference between a conventional landscape lawn and yard um, and a, a habitat. So you're really supporting all these different types of wildlife on different levels, again, above and below the ground. And you're minimizing the use of water. Um, you know, lawns use 9 billion of gallons of water per day. Um, you're also uh, providing and eliminating the harmful chemicals, uh, weed killers and pesticides that harm the beneficial insects that you want to keep in the space that will actually work for you and work for the environment to keep out the, the pests that are actually more detrimental to like vegetable gardens and so forth. Really exciting. We work every year with the National Garden Association. They've been doing a study on people's gardening trends and behaviors over the last uh, 20 years. The last seven years, we have asked specific questions to this natural landscape, sustainable landscaping arena. And one of the things we've seen is that there's been an uptick in the millions of people converting a portion of their lawn to natural or wildlife, wild, wildlife uh friendly landscape. Um, the benefits of this is it reduces greenhouse gas emissions of lawn mowing. It eliminates the cost associated with lawn mowing. And of course, there's the drought tolerant piece that we talked about with the water savings. Uh, the other part of the study, it shows we've had a wonderful uptick from going in one in four people choosing to, to purchase native plants to support wildlife friendly um, practices to now one in three Americans doing that. So really excited to see these trends uh, really move and they've really moved, I, I would say really in the last decade significantly. So let's get into the details about why non-native versus native. So especially in the grass area, if you look at the example here, you've got some turf uh, gra gra grass <laughs> examples and buffalo grass um, which is a native versus the turf. And as you can see, the turf has barely any root system. Um, and some of the other non-natives have limited uh, root systems as well. Uh, on, almost 90% of non-native lawn grasses have roots no more than a few inches deep. Um, when you look at, and this really illustrates what you're we talking about earlier with the also stormwater management, is looking at these root systems, but they also distribute carbon deeper into the ground. And there's studies that have been done by the University of Minnesota that show, um, and these were on perennial flowering and perennial native grasses in um, the Midwest. They looked at how an acre can store up to a ton of carbon dioxide per year. 
we actually have also uh, had a study in 2013 done on some certified wildlife habitats, and they showed significant uh, storing of carbon as well. So really helping all the way around in, in uh, climate in general. Um, also reducing soil erosion with these deep anchoring roots. And as we mentioned before, improving water quality by not only managing the stormwater runoff, but filtering these chemicals and impurities from the water before it enters into the local watershed. I'm gonna turn it over to Brett again. <laughs> Yeah, so typically, again, when you're focusing on um, uh, these native plants, which again are being used to help, uh, in this case of this uh, talk, fit into uh, your plan for benefiting wildlife, you're also inadvertently um, meeting one of the requirements of uh, avoiding and not installing invasive plants in a lead project. So if you're doing a lead renovation on a site somewhere, um, you're not required to remove the invasive plants. So that might be a little more effort there on the sustainable uh, uh, achieving the wildlife certification. But on new construction projects, when you're talking about a fresh slate, one of the things we're doing is we're evaluating uh, the landscape plan. Does it have any invasives? All right, let's review that plan and help you get rid of those invasives at the very least worst case scenario and then come back out during the um, uh, final inspection, the landscape inspection, and make sure there are no invasive. That's sort of the least you have to do. Um, but the biggest opportunity is if you're making this commitment to wildlife certification, again, you're already ensuring 50% of your site has these native and adaptive plants that are benefiting wildlife and avoiding invasive plants because most of the time invasive plants aren't going to benefit them. So there's just, again, win-win uh, right there. Oh, sorry, uh, Mary, you are muted uh, if you want to go back. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for catching that. Uh, what I was going to say is um, one of the areas, too, that I started to talk about carbon as well, um, actually having a, a good diversity of native plants increases the potential carbon sequestration. And there was a study done in 2013 that looked at certified wildlife habitat yards. This was done by UCLA versus non-certified yards. And there was the potential to um, actually sequester across the properties they looked at over 800 tons of metric tons of carbon. So there really are more and more studies showing this actual impact. The other thing is we talked about again, above and below the soil, um, the soil itself, supporting these diverse uh, communities and plant communities actually support soil microbial systems, ecosystems, which are actually a key to long-term soil carbon uh, storage. Another study also done in 2013 showed that native plant gardens, while they're doing this and supporting the soil diversity, um, they're also um, supporting a higher relative abundance of the potential beneficial taxa overall in this ecosystem compared to the adjacent turf grass lawns. And my arrow. Stopped. Okay, there we go. We're going to go into uh, the elements of habitat uh, in detail. So, of course, we talked about food and we talked about the pollen and the nectar ability for all these great species, both butterflies and moths, and also our bees, our pollen specialist bees, and also general bees like bumblebees and others that aren't don't need a specific host plant. Absolutely essential. Uh, the other really key thing is 96% of backyard birds rely on insects to feed their young. So these are birds and these are terrestrial birds, not like song or shorebirds, but uh, I mean, they're songbirds, but not shorebirds. And um, this is so key because since the 70s, we've lost a third of our bird population. So putting these plants into these landscapes where people live, work and play, learn and worship is so essential to actually providing this habitat back for um, maintaining the bird species we have left. Um, one example is a chickadee uh, clutch uh, or brood. In order to feed that initial brood, they need 9,000 caterpillars. So that's what we're talking about in quantities. So that's why it's so important to have this layered habitat that hosts um, all these different insects and caterpillars for these various bird populations. 
again, um, the nectar piece is not only for, you know, bees um, and so forth. It's also in butterflies. It's also for our hummingbirds and uh, our hummingbird moth <laughs> and other types of uh, uh, animals as well. Uh, the other really key thing is um, providing these various uh, atmospheres uh, for a variety of wildlife in your habitat uh, so that they can find the insects they need. They can find uh, the various food sources, leaves and so forth. And of course, the pollen uh, that they need. Um, water. Water for wildlife is essential. Water for us is essential. Um, we're going to talk about some different ways you can incorporate water into these certified wildlife habitats. So really important, obviously, all animals need water to either drink or bathe. So you can provide that through bird baths, uh, small uh, puddles, uh, a natural uh, source nearby as a, a marsh, a pond, a creek. That also counts as one of the requirements uh, for the water uh, category. Creating a small water feature in any of these landscapes is also uh, counts. And again, as I mentioned, bird baths, um, we really recommend um, bird baths to have a bubbler or a fountain, and you can do like a solar bubbler or something because then that reduces the uh, potential of mosquitoes. So, and it also attracts the, the birds uh, a little bit more. Uh, this is just a fun picture <laughs> of uh, a water uh, source potential. And um, and then, of course, puddling dishes are really key for a variety of um, wildlife as well. So butterflies really benefit from puddling dishes like the one to the right, where you put some uh, different stones with a very shallow level of water so that they can just sip and actually benefit from the minerals from the stones. Same thing with some of the bees as well. So those are some really easy ways to do water uh, as well. Brett, did you want to jump in on anything or a question? Well, I was wondering um, if you have it set up so that you know, if there is nearby lakes or streams within whatever, one mile, half a mile, is that something that's allowed as well? It is. It is. And when we go through the checklist requirements, that's referred to there. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, again, more examples of uh, butterflies kind of puddling there uh, in a puddling situation. Uh, cover for wildlife. A variety of plants can provide this cover. And this is really important because both prey and pet predators need that cover um, in order to either hide out or hide from, <laughs> uh, hide out while they're waiting to get, get some uh, food or uh, hide away from being uh, the victim of that. So having that balance is really helpful in your habitat. Uh, so, right. I mean, anything can provide cover, shrubs, you know, bushes, brambles, uh, grasses are really key as well. And just the dense planting of the native plants is so essential, one for providing cover, but it actually also really provides almost a green, a lower green level of um, green mulch and also uh, deters weeds. So that's the other real benefit about this. Once these uh, properties are established, they can be lower maintenance than a traditional landscaped uh, setting. Other examples of cover. Okay, so leaves. And I'm going to talk about leaves because yesterday was the end of Leave the Leaves month, but really fall is our Leave the Leaves time. And uh, we actually did launch Leave the Leaves month to really help educate people that they can create habitat all year long. It's not just when you're planting uh, in the spring or summer. And um, this is so critical. There are significant species that rely on the leaf layer. We're not calling it leaf litter because we think that's a little negative, but really the leaf layer. Um, and there's a big thing, the media kind of picked up on it and they're saying, you don't have to rake your leaves. Well, we're not saying leave your leaves all over the lawn. We're saying strategically place your leaves in your garden beds, in your compost piles um, so that they can actually benefit the full ecosystem. And this is uh, really critical. And I can uh, give you some more resources at the end about uh, this practice. Uh, the other thing is creating um, some, you know, uh, areas of what we call um, kind of shrub piles and snags where they can create, the wildlife can create their own homes and their own uh, areas of cover. Again, um, these are opportunities for um, not only these areas and these types of plantings to do all the other elements, but also they provide places for wildlife to raise their young. So again, 
This cover is absolutely critical for that, but also the different um, elements, whether it's water or a host plant, is actually critical for different plants uh, because their need, I mean, different animals, because their needs are so uh, specific uh, versus the adult phase of their life as they are in their juvenile uh, phases. So one of the key examples that's really easy for people to understand is the monarch butterfly. And it's absolutely critical. What's wonderful about having a native plant garden is you're hitting all of the elements except for water. So it's really, really great because you can be providing these host plants, like in the case of the monarch butterfly, provi providing the milkweed. It is also a host plant for the caterpillar, but it also provides nectar for the adult cycle of the monarch. And what's so critical about this is that milkweed is the only plant uh, monarch butterfly caterpillars can survive on. They have co-evolved. There's toxins in the plant that they absorb. It allows them to stay and detour predators. And it is a beautiful example. And there's many plants like this and many different species that have these symbiotic relationships. So um, milkweed is also essential because 90% of our monarch population has been in decline over the last 20 years. So we have done numerous campaigns around this and uh, want to continue that everyone's native garden should have milkweed in it in some abundance. And here's some beautiful species. That's the other thing I think what's wonderful is that a lot of these species have such visual interest and color. They're really beautiful in the landscape. And I, I think that's important too, to think about the aesthetic. Sometimes natives get a bad rap because it takes them time to, you know, come into full bloom and so forth. But really there are some stunning species uh, that are available that are native and they're not cultivars. We really do advocate having the pure native species because they have more of the the wildlife benefits that sometimes are bred out of some of the cultivar species. So that's important to check as well. Um, Want to really get into conserving water and the sustainable practices um, and how we can do that on many different levels. So I'm going to turn it over to Brett here for a second. Yeah. So again, another connection here. Um with the types of kind of going to the plantings and obviously Mary, you call out lots of other things outside of <laughs> uh, just the, the types of plants we use that are important for wildlife. But as far as the plantings go, that make a big impact. And so again, when those plantings are native adaptive species, um, you also have the ability to pick up water conservation points. And so there's a prescriptive path to do that uh, outside uh, outdoor water use. And so the effect, the essential way of doing that is just having a, a higher ratio of native and adaptive plants uh, versus turf grass. And so there's kind of the breakdown on that chart there on the left of, again, just having more of that ratio. And so having a 50% set aside, you know, of, of uh, being required for uh, the wildlife certification for the lead innovation point, you know, you're already talking potentially two points on the prescriptive path uh, of ensuring uh, that set aside. On the performance path, you're kind of taking all of the different water conservation opportunities inside and outside, running them through a water modeling platform. And on the outdoor water, we're using the EPA's water budget. So you can see on the right here is just an example. So if you're looking at your um, wildlife certified landscape, and you're looking probably most likely at you know, different types of trees, shrubs, and ground covers, you're measuring that square footage and you're determining its water use and whether it's irrigated. And again, that's how you're going to get your points by having that, those lower water use um, applications that are being set aside. Now, as Mary pointed out, there are water features that are required for um, plant life. So if those water features are using water, well, then that has to be a, a, a documented as well in the total water performance, which could be a negative unless you're strategic about it. Again, capturing storm water and then using it for the water for wildlife. So we see that all the time. So those are just some, again, some ways that it all ties into some of the lead credit. So thanks. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, these are some other sustainable practices. We really do recommend keeping uh, cats indoors. Um, we have various articles and fact sheets on this. Um, this is a, an area that is important uh, for sustainable gardening and protecting wildlife. 
And um, the thing we've talked about before is chemicals and particularly pesticides because they kill plants and the insects that the birds rely on for food. And there's also increasing studies that show particularly a, a chemical called neonicotinoids is very systemic and it's used um, to deter pests, um, particularly in the lawn and garden area but, and in and a lot of products, but the problem is they're finding it's very systemic. It's actually getting into the birds and it's also getting potentially into human populations. So um, there's also other chemicals uh, like Roundup and others that there are significant studies about their impact as well. So the more you can plant densely, you don't use chemicals, you use natural fertilizers and compost, uh, you're really eliminating all those chemical impacts in a space. And it's much, much more healthy for both you and wildlife. Uh, and also helps with organic pest control. Um, you're not killing off um, the pests that you need that are natural pests and predator predators um, and really supports kind of an overall organic gardening uh, approach. The other thing I want to talk about in sustainable gardening is um, really how we uh, minimize bird strikes. And those are looking at feeder placement, uh, putting uh, using uh, decals so that uh, you're reducing window reflection and also turning off lights during migration periods for a specific species, particularly through high urban areas. Uh, and then some other ways are to turn off lights at night, reduce landscape lighting. Um, there's some special, uh, you know, yellow bulbs that help with this and also use down facing lights as opposed to kind of uplit lights as well. Uh, the other thing is to use uh, sustainable products in your landscape. So using it in beautiful features that are either sculptures or benches or birdhouses, using recycled ma materials uh, made in the U.S. Um, to really focus on reduce and reusing, maybe creating things out of recycled and salvaged materials as well. So I'm going to get into the checklist here. This is a checklist we have online, um, but what it does is just help you kind of do a walkthrough of a property to see that you have these elements. You only need a minimum number of uh, each of the in each of these categories to actually qualify for certification. And the actual certification application is online. It's a it's a more of an interactive online application at our nwf.org/certifiedwildlifehabitat. Uh, this checklist is at nwf.org slash certify. And I've highlighted uh, some of the things we've added for the fall uh, here. That's what the yellow highlights are here, just because we are in fall. Um, but you can do any of these. So we've we've really gone over all these food sources Again, striving for 50 to 70% of native plants. And this is where um, we're talking about the water requirements in your question, uh, Brett, that um, you can have a nearby lake, stream, uh, ocean, <laughs> uh, river, et cetera, um, can count as a water source. It really needs to be um, within, I mean, ideally it would be within 500 feet of the property. Um, if it's huge body of water, it can be within a mile. But um, if it's just like a creek or a small pond, it should be relatively close to the property um, itself. So these are some of the areas. And then we get into the cover checklist. This is all on one sheet, but I broke it up for the, for the PowerPoint. So when we um, have the cover, we also have the places to raise young. And it's interesting, you know, just like the native plants, having this fallen uh, leaf layer and also cutting your dead kind of stalks uh, of your perennial flowers and leaving at least 12 to 18 inches allows for uh, areas for um, some insects, solitary bees and others to use that during the winter months uh, to hibernate and to, uh, to stay safely. Uh, so it's another form of cover and also places to raise young. Uh, and then when we really get into the categories of sustainable practices, I've touched on some of these today, but you can really look at a variety of things. So we've talked about, um, you know, uh, the rain garden, but also capturing rainwater from your roof, um, building a riparian buffer, um, actually doing xeriscaping, uh, using a drip or soaker hose as opposed to just watering and mass um, and just limiting water use in general. Again, you will be limiting your water use if you're using native plants, um, a variety of other uh, things here. So 
Um, the other thing that we touched on was controlling exotic species. And that really was, um, you know, removing those invasive plants, um, practicing some of these other elements here, and again, eliminating chemicals, uh, pesticides, and fertilizers. So I'm going to pause here if there's any questions, because the next section is just a bunch of resources I have for you. Um, well, right. I, I, I think, um, you know, Mary, um, from the documentation standpoint and this checklist, are you all also looking at photo documentation or like a video tour of the site? How are people um, um, yes. verifying this? So the program has over has evolved over time. And originally we did require, and these were years ago before I started, I started in 2014, but mm. back before 2010, I would say, um, the, the program did require more of those, uh, supplemental documentation, but with the mass of people doing this and limited less staff resources, we have not been able to really verify all those. So this is an honor system. It is yeah. people making a commitment. It's an education system. It's certifying and buying a sign so you can educate the people around you why you're intentionally landscaping this way. So right. we're not right now requiring um, photo or video um, or other supplemental documentation. It's really going online and um, committing to doing all these uh, steps. Okay. Uh, and I'd imagine, you know, from uh, those of you doing lead project certification, you know, not only checking these items off, but being able to verify them in some way. And, you know, if you're working with us, uploading them. So we'll, that's probably something, you know, that we need to see from a lead standpoint. But at the end of the day, we're just looking for the certificate from, from you all. Now, um, are there fees for people to participate in this or how does that work? Yeah, sure. So there is a $20 application processing fee. Okay. Um, we offer promotions throughout the year that you can um, apply and you'll get a discount on your fee and also a discount on your sign. So mm -hmm. kind of bundling that together. Um, those usually happen in the spring, mm -hmm. uh, midsummer, and then just most recently in October. So we do try to encourage more people to do that in those more active seasons. Um, and that um, fee really just goes back into our program work. So it's yeah. more of an administrative fee. Right. And I know people can make additional donations on top of that to support. Yes. That this effort, lovely. right? Yeah, that would be <laughs> as, lovely. Yes. As we always recommend. Um, you know, some one of our uh, members here had a great point there saying, Oh, AI photo recognition. I know people have those plant apps and you take a real close picture of a plant and it's telling you what it is, but maybe even like a larger photo that says, Oh, yeah, the artificial intelligence is picking out everything in the picture. I would love to get to that point on our system. I, I mean, we really are looking at kind of upgrading this over the next few years so that it's yeah. more interactive. It 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 it's it allows people to actually show those visual um, kind of proof of what they're doing. Right now, um, one of our members had a great point, you know, and I, it made me think, you know, because we're talking about sort of certifying chunks of land. Right. And, and just with like anything, you're sort of just a small piece among a larger ecosystem where maybe the rest of your neighbors aren't certified, right? And right. worst case scenario, he was saying, well, one of my neighbors has this particular plant and its seeds keep falling off and mm -hmm. replanting itself in my garden, ruining my landscape. So any thoughts on how you're how to deal with sort of this sort of yeah. other than educating your neighbors and getting yeah. them on board, you know, yeah. you have this sort of bits and pieces and doesn't that harm wildlife when you have that? I mean, what are your thoughts there? Well, so that's a really good point. So one of the things that's also being studied is the fact that there's so much fragmentation of habitat in our urban suburban areas. Um, the more density we have of, of these kind of certified wildlife habitat properties, it, it, they're actually showing that impact. So while yes, those small instances can harm that, you're still doing more harm, more good than harm by mm -hmm. increasing this. And again, the studies were showing like if you have these two yards side by side, you're still attracting beneficial wildlife. Now, 
I mean, yeah. I I'll, I have an example. My neighbor had an Andina plant, which those berries do nothing for wildlife where I live. And um, the, they kept coming into my yard and dropping and creating Andina plants. And I did not want those. So, I mean, it's kind of working with them and it's just staying on top of it and ripping it out before they <laughs> get too big. And that's, that's tough that you have to do that. But, you know, I mean, we can't all control our neighbors. We do have a tip sheet for neighbor friendly practices that we can <laughs> um, share as well. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, and then, you know, some questions came in and I'm just going to kind of consolidate it into the question I had. And that is um, all this effort doing all this landscaping and all this planning versus just maybe acquiring a site and just completely leaving it alone or letting what's already there just grow. What are you, I mean, what are the thoughts sort of on this sort of leave it alone, let it grow approach? Can that be effective? Does it need to be strategic? I think it I think the issue in urban suburban areas is that so much of our land has been disrupted and mm -hmm. disturbed. And so the challenge with leaving it alone is there are often significant invasive plants in those areas. So and they sometimes take over and push out the native plants. So okay. actually um, and we are actually working. We have a huge partnership with a major real estate developer, Taylor Morrison. They have 14, they're in 14 states and they've committed in their communities as they develop them to do open space certifications with us. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly that. It's leaving what is native, what is natural in that area, but also removing the invasives. Um, mm -hmm. So really, and actually adding in potentially more natives that are conducive to that environment. Um in that space. So it, 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 unfortunately, because we've made so much in uh, impact uh, negatively on some spaces, it's really mm -hmm. hard. Now, obviously if you're, if you're budding a natural reserve or mm -hmm. a park where that has been, I mean, even those are maintained by wildlife management. So, mm -hmm. and plant and botanists to make sure mm -hmm. that, that, you know, invasives are not taking over. We have a beautiful park where I live and this bamboo grass keeps coming in and it's, you know, they have to remove it because it takes, it kills all the beautiful spring ephemeral wildflowers that are so critical to some of these pollen specialist uh, species. If you don't manage it, you, you, so you really just can't completely let it go. You really need to kind of stay on top of it. Mm -hmm. Um. And I, a question that came in about the education of our plant nurseries, are you working with them all so that they're highlighting, maybe featuring, maybe only up selling, you know, these types of plantings that are going to help wildlife? Absolutely. And one of the resources I have to share with you is gardenforwildlife.com, where we are creating a network of uh, nurseries that are native plant growers that are growing with certain uh, standards for us. And then you can actually get plants shipped to you from those nurseries native to the eco grown in the eco region you reside and ship to you uh, within that region. So that's one area, but on a larger scale, we have been working with the uh, industry horticultural industry for some time. We had launched the million pollinator garden challenge uh, 2015 and ran it to 2018 with many different partners, including the garden trade. We, mm -hmm surpassed a million gardens, which is wonderful. Um, but that's when we really started working with the garden trade on educating them to one, not use chemicals, to really increase the levels of natives, to mm -hmm. look at the whole cultivar, you know, are these really helpful to wildlife or not? And here's some standards around that. So we continue to work with that. We actually in 2018 had surveyed um, uh hundreds of nurseries and have been engaging them uh, over the years. So this is definitely something. And a lot of nurseries um, have just completely done that, especially the independent garden centers. They have native plant sections. They have in my area, I'm on the Chesapeake Bay, Bay friendly, um, you know, mm -hmm. water wise, uh, all these different sections that are usually comprised of native plants, but they might put a spin on it locally on other benefits that those plants can can do. Great. Well, I know you have some resources for us and let's get through those. And if there's still time, we'll get to some more questions. So thanks. Yeah. So nwf.org slash garden is kind of the umbrella and we have a variety of program and um, every element that I talked about today, we go in much more detail about food, water, cover and places to raise young as well as sustainable um, practices. Um, we have a whole section on native plants and a variety of resources on how to find the right plants for you, which I'm going to go into, and obviously the whole section on how to certify. Um, so we have some specific 
uh, resources here to look at native plant options uh, for you. So we have uh, different things. We've partnered with Xerxes and others to do the Monarch Nectar uh, plant list. We have host plants by eco region and we have keystone uh, plants by eco region. Uh, lots of different tip sheets and areas and you can um, click on those. Oh, we're back to this thing now. Okay, it's working. So it's by eco region. So this is an example for the Monarch Nectar list. You would find your state and see the color coding and then go to the tip sheet uh, link that's color coded to find the plants for you. Uh, same thing with our keystone plants. We have a map for that and it will give you the keystone plants that help both uh, butterflies and moths and also pollen specialist bees by eco region. And then this is an example of the monarch nectar plant list. And then this is the really, really exciting one we have. You can find plants by zip code by the native plant finder. And this was done um, on research that Doug Tallamy's team, Kimberly Shropshire and others on his team provided this over 10,000 species of butterflies and moths paired with the 4,000 uh, genera uh, plant species that are the host plants for those, you put your zip code in and it then gives you the local species near you that you should plant. Um, and this, just as a clarification, people sometimes get confused, this gives you a list of the top about 15 plants that support the highest numbers of, of Lepidoptera where you live. And it's so it's not just general like native plant list. It actually has more of a function in providing those real high performers to you. So that's um, one really essential resource. And then we have, as I mentioned, gardenforwildlife.com. You can go there. They're in 38 states right now. This is now a for-profit that has spun off of National Wildlife Federation, but it is a social enterprise that provides Eventually, it's still in its early days, but once it makes a profit, we're hoping that it will um, really you know, contribute back to the mission of NWF. But it contributes to our mission by selling these native plants and educating people about this mission as well. So that um, is a really great resource. And then um, we also are developing more and more do not plant lists for select states. Um, this is some that we've developed. Um, we're trying to do more. It's been partly by request of different landscapers and so forth and big projects, um, but trying to give them alternatives to invasives uh, or, or, you know, other like cultivars that they might want to have in their landscape plan, but then they, they want to look for the other options. So we're, we're building that library as well. Um, so those are some, and then these are all of our tip sheets. This is all in the resources section of nwf.org slash garden. There's a variety of them. And then again, the certification piece, we have a partnership with Wild Birds Unlimited who's supporting getting your yard certified as well. So you can get information from your local Wild Birds Unlimited store. And we also, as I mentioned before, our state affiliates. We have 27 state affiliates that are very active in promoting Garden for Wildlife and Certified Wildlife Habitats. And when you certify in those states, they also get a share of the uh, processing fee. So it helps their state mission, uh, wildlife mission. And also you can get a co-branded sign um, with, for example, you know, National Wildlife Federation and one of these affiliates like Nebraska or Vermont or whoever. <laughs> so um, that's a really other nice partnership that we're really proud of as well and great resources on their sites. Um, so, and then just stay in touch and share what you're doing. I would love to see these lead projects on social media. We would love to share them. So please reach out to me if you have, when you talk about documentation, that's one way we're sharing documentation of what people are doing. So if you do have some great sites of your landscape, of your uh, project, um, we'd love to figure out a way to share these. And we also have an annual photo contest um, that we are reinstituting for next year uh, as well. So lots of lots of opportunities there overall. And then we have a book um, that our naturalist David Mizajewski wrote about attracting birds, butterflies, and other backyard wildlife. And you can get that at our shop site on nwf.org. So those are the resources. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Mary. Well, I know uh, you need to get going here. So we're going to send out some of the other questions to you ahead. But I really appreciate your time and your effort and the National um, uh, Wildlife uh, Federation for having you on here and appreciate you know you going through all of this. I wanted to say a huge thanks to our board of directors, our volunteers, our executive director, 
and our top tier sponsors, Reem and Mitsubishi, who allow us to do what we do and help make projects more sustainable. I think at the end of the day, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the place for people to go to start their certification process would be down here, right? NWF.org slash certify. Is that correct? That's where they can start, get kind of the overview and then click on the button into the tool that they can apply in. Great. Well, um, we're at our time here. So Mary, thank you so much. Yeah. Have a good rest of your week. Take care, everyone. Stay yeah. well. So thank All right. you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.